Well, you're all very welcome. Um, my name is Patrick Murphy. I chair the Foreign Policy Group here in the Institute. Uh, just a, a housekeeping point. Um, I think you will appreciate uh, being told that you should put your phones on mute, as I am doing now. Um, it will avoid embarrassment for you, perhaps <laughs> later. Um, we are very honoured and pleased to have today uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Colombia, Minister Carlos Holmes Trujillo Garcia, um, and uh, Eamon Gilmore, uh, our own former Foreign Minister, <coughs> who is also Special Representative of the European Union for Colombia. <coughs> uh, the Minister um, Holmes is going to speak about the Colombian peace with legality policy and regional and global challenges. Um, the Colombian peace process, uh, like other peace processes, including our own, is, I think, a, a delicate plant which needs much tending. Um, I think we, um, that are at the other side of the Atlantic, tend to hear about it uh, when it is in difficulty. Um, and there have been some complications very recently, uh, but they uh, may not necessarily represent uh, the full picture, which is why we appreciate very much uh, the minister um, agreeing to come and speak to us. Uh, before he speaks, uh, Eamon Gilmore, who, as I said, is Special Representative of the European Union to Colombia, will say a few words. Eamon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boric, and um, uh, you're very welcome. Minister and uh, Ambassadors uh, Patricia Cortes, Ambassador of Colombia to Ireland, and Ambassador Alison Milton, Ambassador of Ireland to, uh, to Colombia. Um, it's, it's my great uh, privilege to uh, formally uh, introduce uh, you, Minister, to, uh, uh, to this gathering today. Um, I know of very few people, if any, who have as distinguished a combined political and governmental and diplomatic uh, record um, uh, as, as you have. Uh, you have been, um, uh, I, I, I will no doubt leave out some of the offices you, you, you've held, but you've been the Minister for Education for your country, Minister for the Interior, High Commissioner for Peace, uh, Mayor of Cali, you were a founder member with former President Uribe of the Central Democratic Party, and indeed the first time we met was in your capacity as the uh, foreign affairs spokesperson uh, for Central Democratic. But in addition to that, you have also been ambassador to Austria, to Russia, to the Scandinavian countries, to the Organization of American States, and you served as uh, the ambassador of Colombia to the European Union from 2006 uh, to 2010, so you know us very well. Uh, you've, you've taken over the role um, just over a year ago as uh, Minister for Foreign Relations. It's at a very challenging time in global affairs. Many of big issues on our agenda, global, the issues of climate, uh, uh, the state of uh, the multilateral um, order, but it's also at a very challenging time uh, for Colombia. Uh, implementation of the peace agreement, uh, the situation in uh, Venezuela, uh, the uh, migration uh, issue which is arising uh, from uh, that and the humanitarian issues which, uh, also, uh, which also arise. You are here in Ireland, I think, at a time, first of all, when the relations between the European Union and Colombia uh, are at a very strong point, and Federica Mogherini was in uh, uh, Bogota just last week, and I know met with you and met with uh, uh, President uh, Duque, and you have been since uh, you've taken office, been in Brussels a number of times, uh, met with uh, European leaders there. It's also at a very, I think, at a time when the relationship between Ireland and Colombia is at its best ever. Just recently, uh, last year, uh, Colombia opened its resident embassy here in Dublin under the leadership of Ambassador Patricia Cortes, and Ireland opened its resident embassy in Bogota under Ambassador uh, Alison Milton, both of whom are here today. And of course, both of them building on the great work 
which was done in Colombia by our honorary consul, Carlos Gomez, who I know is a very close friend of yours and who has served this country very well in Colombia. And of course, the work uh, that was done here over many years by the uh, embassy in, uh, in London. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Jose Piana, who is here in, in today <laughs> representing the, the trade, um, uh, the, the uh, pro-Colombia, uh, but also represented uh, the embassy here for uh, many times. I know you've, you've wanted to come here a number of times. You told me so. Mm -hmm. I'm really delighted that you are here, and it's my honour to uh, ask you to address us uh, today. You're very welcome, Mr. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you. How do you pronounce your name? Patrick? Patrick. Patrick? Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for being with us today. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you a question first. What do you prefer? You prefer that I make a statement first, or may I open, or do you want me to open the floor to, to questions so that I can answer them? I think I'm writing for one thing or for the other, whatever you wish. I think it should be uh, ideal if you could make a, a statement and then okay. there will be an exchange of questions and comments. Okay. As, as, as time is short as I have been, to I have been told, I'll, I'll touch upon in a nutshell several issues. First, the stage of the implementation of the agreement that was signed by the previous president with FARC. And second, some regional issues, of course, making emphasis in Venezuela and the migration crisis that we are facing. Uh, as far as has to do with the, with the accord, the policy is implementation of the agreement with modifications and adjustments for the future through consensus and institutional means. That's the policy. Why is that the policy? Because that's the policy that was decided by the Colombian people in several locations. During the plebiscite, during the internal process of Central Democratic Party, during the popular consultation mm -hmm. process that took place in order to select a candidate of a large political force, which was won by today's President Duque during the first round of the presidential election and during the second round of the presidential election. What does that policy mean? First of all, implementation of the agreement. Second, adjustment in some particular issues, but through consensus and institutional means. What is the stage in which we are now? Implementation is going on. This was uh, conceived as a 15-year process, and I'm sure that it will take longer. As you, you know, you have the experience in Ireland of how long it normally, normally, normally takes. But uh, we, are doing, we are doing a huge effort, and we have the verification of the United Nations mission permanently in Colombia. As you know, there is a United Nations verification mission every three months. That verification mission makes a report that is presented to the Security Council of the United Nations. So as far as the international follow-up of what we are doing in Colombia, <coughs> there is not a highest authority that the Secretary General of the United Nations and the Security Council of the United Nations. We s recently, we had a visit of the Security Council. They went to Colombia because we invited them to go. In that sense, we are a very open country. We'd let the, we told the members of the Security Council, go down to Colombia, meet with whomever you wish to meet, have an idea of what is going on, see the possibilities, the difficulties, the advances, the complications that we have, the complexity of the implementation of the agreement, and with that view on the ground, tell the international community whatever you think is most advisable to tell. After that, there was a new report presented by the Secretary General to the Security Council of the United, of the United Nations, and the Security Council approved by unanimity that report, as has been the case with all the reports that have been presented uh, by the, that verification mission. Is the implementation complex? The complexity is huge. This is a completely type of agreement to those that were uh, agreed upon in the past, because we have always been a country open to political, to political solutions. And uh, this agreement is different because, first of all, it was negotiated after the entry into force of the Rome Statute, which has to do a lot with the justice component of the, of the agreement. And secondly, because it uh, broke 
the custom that we used to have in Colombia, which were handling the implementation stage of the agreement through legal frameworks. This is a much more complex one. This is a 310 pages agreement that touches upon each and every sector of Colombian life. So it makes the implementation much more complicated to do. But that is the line of the government as far as the implementation of the agreement is, is concerned. So advances, yes. Difficulties, yes. Complexity, yes. A lot of work to be done, yes. There is nothing to hide about what is going on in Colombia as far as this is concerned. Secondly, regional issues. As you can imagine, Venezuela is, is the issue that uh, occupies most of our time in this, in this uh, particular juncture. What are we doing in the case of Venezuela? We are doing in the case of Venezuela what we always have done as members of the Organization of American States and signatories of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. As you very well know, we have in our region a uh, legal framework that uh, allow us and oblige us to act collectively in different cases. In the case of democracy, the Inter-American uh, Democratic Charter obliges us to act collectively, that is to say with the other countries, in order to save democracy whenever, wherever democracy is challenged or try to restore democracy wherever it is a breakdown of, of democracy. So in this case, we are acting out of our legal and political duties as members of the inter-American community. Secondly, we are acting in defense of our national interest. You know, the situation in Venezuela is very complicated to us, and that is why we are facing a huge migration, migration crisis. What is the situation in this sense? We have received already 1.4 million Venezuelans. Just for you to have an idea, the first time we spoke about this publicly in Colombia, mm, we had 900,000 Venezuelans in Colombia, and we explained to the Colombian public opinion that we were working with three hypothetical scenarios. If the situation in Venezuela remained the, ch the same and the situation has not changed, on the contrary, it is getting worse and worse. We said those months back, if the situation keeps on being like it is, we will be having promptly close to 1,200,000 Venezuelans. Now we have more. The second hypothetical scenario with which we were working those months back were if the situation keeps on being like it is and doesn't change at all, the following scenario would be 1,800,000. So we are heading to that scenario. And we said if the situation becomes graver and graver in Venezuela, the number might be of 3 million Venezuelans in Colombia. What is the situation today? There are 4.4 million Venezuelans who have left their country. Some research shows that the number might go up to close to 8 million in 2020. If that is the case, we are receiving close to 33% of that number of migrants. So that would mean close to 3 million Venezuelans in Colombia, a little bit less. Uh, let me speak with round figures just for you to know how complicated this is. What is the policy? The policy is receiving our Venezuelan brothers with fraternity, with a humanitarian sense, with solidarity sense, and as well with historical gratitude sense, because in the past there were many Colombians that went to Venezuela looking for better living conditions. At the time of the oil boom in Venezuela, many of them have already returned to Colombia. We are doing all we can. We are putting resources from the national level, regional level, local level, but the <coughs> magnitude of the crisis goes over our capacity to face it. So that is why, since the very beginning of the administration, we knocked the door of the region and told our colleagues, this is not a Colombian issue, this is a regional issue, and we got to work together in order to harmonize migration measures so that allow us to face in the most appropriate way this handling that is a common crisis, that is a common crisis. 
And we went as well to the United Nations system to ask for the appointment of a high envoy, joint envoy of a migration, international migration organization and office of the High Commissioner for Refugees, in order for him to help us to coordinate international measures in the region. Actually, they did that, and they appointed Eduardo Stein, a former vice president of Guatemala and former foreign minister of Guatemala. He's been doing a very, very, very dedicated, dedicated job. We value very much the cooperation of the international community, but we need more. There is no other way. We need more. You know, the crisis increases every second in Colombia. It is affecting, of course, health system, education system, social security system. And there is no <coughs> other way, no other way than receiving more international cooperation. Uh, we have received with generosity international cooperation from several countries and some group of countries, but we need more. We cannot handle that huge, immense crisis alone. We cannot. Just for you to have an idea. Few, few months back, there was a uh, joint call launched by the International Organization for Migration and the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees of the United Nations. They were trying to get 740 million US dollars up to now. They have only collected 30% in the rate of that resources flowing into is very slow and slow and slow and slow. Just to make a per capita comparison of what a refugee is getting, let me tell you that a Venezuelan refugee is getting $68 more or less, while a Syrian refugee is receiving $560. So, and the rate of increase of the number of migrants is the first one. In numbers, Syria refugee crisis is the first one, Venezuela is the second one, but in rate of increase of the number of migrants at this stage leaving their country, Venezuela is the first one. And of course, it all has to do with Colombia. So in this point, an immense challenge, solidarity, humanitarian sense, historical gratitude, and more international cooperation because we cannot face this issue alone. I stop here just to open the floor to questions. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I think you have, um, you have highlighted uh, two um, particular points which um, I think will be very useful for uh, those of us who follow at some distance uh, the um, situation in Colombia. Uh, the first uh, is your emphasis on the fact that the um, peace process in Colombia is at an implementation stage and you um, underlined that this was a 15-year process and inevitably um, it is uh, a process that is uh, full of, uh, to use your own words, complications and complexities of all sorts. Um, you talk about a 310-page agreement which touches on all aspects of life in Colombia. Um, of course, uh, we in this country are well able to appreciate uh, complications and complexities in a peace process, but uh, it was very useful uh, for you to underline the extent to which this applies in the case of uh, Colombia. Uh, the second point you made was that of uh, refugees. Um, I personally uh, was not aware of the huge extent uh, in terms of percentage of uh, Venezuelan uh, refugees in Colombia, uh, 1.4 million, uh, that's to say uh, one third of all uh, refugees uh, in uh, Colombia with, uh, you say, a, a potential to rise to twice that figure. Um, we here at, in this side of the world are very uh, conscious of uh, the refugee flows out of Syria. Um, I think uh, from what you tell us, 
the impact of Venezuelan refugees um, in Colombia is quite as large as that of Syrian refugees in uh, Jordan or the Lebanon. Um, you eloquently um, described to us how this uh, inflow exceeds your capacity and you plead for help. So uh, thank you for um, underlining these aspects of the problems you are facing. I now throw the floor open to uh, questions or comments. Uh, I would ask you if you are asking a question or making a comment uh, that you state who you are and what your uh, affiliation is. So the floor is open. <coughs> University College Dublin. Um, when you speak about the adjustments in the peace process, what uh, form do you picture these adjustments taking, and will they be affecting the jurisdiction of the JEP? I, I could take some some questions, and then I will reply to all of them. Thank you. Yeah. I'm the Norwegian ambassador here in uh, Dublin. Uh, and thank you for a most interesting presentation. Uh, as you know, uh, Norway has uh, a long-term commitment to support uh, Colombia. Uh, how, and thank you for reminding us about the uh, number of refugees in Colombia from Venezuela, because I think the discussion is so much about Europe and about Syria and how it affects us here. Uh, I was wondering if you could say something about um, the peace process in connection with Venezuela, the situation in Venezuela, and this huge uh, impact of uh, refugees and of a difficult situation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Grania Kilcullen from Christian Aid Ireland, um, uh, and thank you for your statement. I would just like to know um, what the Colombian government's sort of ro recognition of the role of human rights defenders is in the implementation of the peace process, because I think we're all very aware of the very grave situation that social leaders, community leaders, human rights defenders, activists are facing in Colombia, and how devastating that the death toll has been for them so I, I would like to, to 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 know that and maybe some ideas of of Colombia's efforts to for their protection maybe we can take these three questions I can take some more you can take some more yes hi um, David Joyce from the Irish Congress of trade unions uh, maybe just to supplement um, Gronia's question there um, in relation to our counterparts in Colombia. Colombia has consistently been the most dangerous country in the world to do trade union work and, and the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, published its um, Global Rights Index in uh, June this year which, which stated that 34 uh, trade unionists lost their lives in Colombia during 2018, uh, an increase from 15 the previous year. So I suppose um, I, I just like to hear um, your thoughts on that and what, what's happening in relation to protections, etc., cetera, for, for people. Yes. Phil Ryan, member of the Institute. Um, part of Colombia uh, has the Amazon forest, as we call it, and uh, we've had uh, all of that um, tragedy in uh, Brazil mainly. I'm just wondering, has there been any effect from that in Colombia, and how the native people in Colombia, who, you know, uh, have a hard time anyway, how, how are they being affected by, by what's happening? in the Amazon at the moment. Okay. Adjustments. Uh, 
First of all, the idea of the adjustments is not to touch upon the body of the, the agreement. And they are conceived only for the implementation stage. Okay? Not backwards, not retroactive, but for the future. Some of them, that narco trafficking and kidnapping cannot be considered never again as crimes connected to political crimes making those who commit those crimes subject to amnesties or pardons for the future. Secondly, if a member of Congress belonging to the new party FARC is found guilty of grave crimes by the special jurisdiction for peace, not by ordinary justice, but by the special jurisdiction for peace, that that person has to retire from Congress, but in such a case, the political party FARC will have the capacity to say who is going to replace that person. Third, if a member of former FARC is found with goods or resources that were not declared at the due opportunity, that person will, be, will receive severe, severe uh, penalties. Okay? Fourth, any time any crime committed, any type of crime committed by one former combatant after the signing of the agreement will fall under the jurisdiction of the special jurisdiction for peace, not, no, not under the jurisdiction of the special jurisdiction for peace, but under the jurisdiction of the ordinary justice system of the country. Fourth, that sexual crimes committed against child doesn't fall in any case into the jurisdiction of the special jurisdiction for peace. Those are the adjustments for the future. Uh, as far as the special jurisdiction for peace has to do, no, no adjustment <coughs> pretends to weaken the special jurisdiction for peace on the contrary. All the adjustments that may be conceived from now on are to strengthen the special jurisdiction for peace. It's a new system. Always, always, not in this case, but always, in any case, there, is, there are always vacuums, there are always clarities that has to be made, so... But the important point is that no, no, there is not the purpose, not the policy of President Duque to weaken the special jurisdiction for peace, but to strengthen it and to give it more clarity. Uh, to the ambassador of Norway. Migrants, yes, yes, I, I came to ask you a favor. Allow us to, to make this better known, because we are living a tragedy, actually, and not many people know about it. There is no international consciousness about the magnitude of the challenge that we as a country are going through and the magnitude of the challenge that our region is facing. All eyes are put on the CDS case and other cases, and of course, I'm, I'm not saying that, that that is a bad thing, but we need more eyes, more eyes, more interest, more help, and more company in the case of the region because the numbers are growing and growing and growing of people living living Venezuela. And the agreement in Venezuela, they are linked in some in some way they are linked. In in what sense? In the sense that the Maduro regime is open up to terrorist organizations. That is that, that, that has a lot of proofs along along the years. So uh, these guys that announced the creation of a new group, which is a criminal group because those they are fugitives actually. They have been chased by narco-trafficking uh, connections. They are in Venezuela. They have the support of Venezuela. They have the protection of Venezuela. So in that sense, the Venezuela way of acting affects our possibilities for peace. Uh, human rights defenders, yes, that's a source of great concern. And uh, there are a lot of measures that have been put in place by, by the government. The opportune plan of action. There is a reinforcement of the different uh, systems that exist in Colombia in order to provide uh, security to them. 
there is of course a great effort in order to strengthen the early warning system with the support of Defensoria del Pueblo and of course with the mission to support the peace process of the organization of American states. There are new, new security arrangements in the 24 territorial spaces where uh, former FAR combatants are, some of them, because none of them decided to be in these uh, spaces which are secure, which are full of facilities. Uh, the, as of 31st of July 2019, the National Protection Unit had 231 schemes of protection for persons uh, in the process of reincorporation of, of FARC. Uh, the number of homicides have been going down. Of course, that is not satisfactory. The only satisfactory figure is that no one is being killed in, in Colombia. And uh, the president himself has uh, given orders to the different institutions that are responsible for providing security to social leaders and to former FARC combatants to make a revision of the functions and procedures and means that they have in order to be more effective in the fulfilling of the task, the institutional task that they have. And as a result of that, there are new 23 specific measures for the protection of uh, not only social leaders but former combatants of, of FARC. We, we, we are going through a very complicated time because of this. In some regions of the country where the FARC left, new criminal gangs went in. So the point here is the criminal sources of resources. So there is a kind of, there is a kind of combat between some criminal organizations in, in some regions of, of the country that leads, of course, to the killing of people living in those, in those areas. So the decision of the government is to do the utmost efforts in order to combat those illegal groups so that the level of protection increases in, in those particular areas where there are sources of illegal resources. I'm speaking about narco-trafficking, I'm speaking about illegal mining, and I'm speaking about extortion as well. Uh, that happens in some regions of, of the country. But we are aware of this, and uh, the government is doing the utmost effort in order to increase the level of, of, of protection. And it has to do as well with, uh, with, the trade, with the trade union trade union members. This is an effort that has been made by, by many, many years. Uh, there is still a, l a lot of work to be done a lot of work to be done, no doubt about it, but you can count on the will of the government, in the, in its, in the power of the government, to use the legitimate force of the state in order to prevent those killings to, to happen and that situation, to ch that situation to change, in order to have a better protection, protection environment for them. Um, Amazon. There is a priority. The, the president has a priority in the Amazonian region. Recently, as you might know, we had a summit of Amazonian countries in Leticia that were less than a, less than a month ago. The summit was attended by uh, Brazil, mm, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Guyana, Suriname, and Colombia. And the presidents or head of states or heads of delegation who attended that summit in Leticia, in the Colombian Amazon, agreed upon what is called a Leticia Action Plan. Uh, I, I'm going to provide it to you, just for you to have uh, an idea of the specific measures that were agreed upon by the heads of state that attended that summit in, in Leticia. The name of the document, which is very complete, it's an integral document, is Leticia Pact. 
So, but this is to tell you that there is a priority in the foreign policy of President Duque, the Amazonian region. I can. Could I maybe just add one word to, yeah, sure. to what David raised about the, the killing of human rights defenders, which, as, as you know, Minister, is always top of mm -hmm. the agenda when we, when we talk. Uh, the European Union uh, had, is doing a project supporting the prosecutor's office in uh, Colombia, the establishment of a special investigations unit, which we launched uh, during my last visit uh, to Colombia. And that project is, it, it will be led by a Spanish prosecutor, and it is focused on making the link between the guy who pulls the trigger and whoever ordered the killing to take place in the first, to, to, to be undertaken in the first place. So that's a, a particular contribution that the European Union will be making to the, the fight against the killing of social leaders and bringing those who were ultimately responsible uh, to account and to justice. Could, could I ask a question, perhaps, which arises out of uh, what uh, you have already said, Minister? Um, I think when um, Ivan Marquez um, announced um, at the end of August that uh, he was resuming the armed struggle, um, if I'm not mistaken, this announcement was made um, in a particular um, area of Colombia itself, which perhaps is inaccessible to uh, the central authorities. Is there um, a problem of uh, territorial inaccessibility um, in regard to um, the full integration of all parts of Colombian society in the course of the peace process? Uh, Colombia is a large country, very, very large one, 1,260,000 kilometers. Mm, full of jungles, full of mountains, not totally integrated, not completely integrated. So the main institutional effort that we have to make is to guarantee the presence of the state, which in some areas is weak because of these particular features, mm. so that the presence of the state guarantees the rights of people living there. Those areas doesn't, doesn't have the larger number of population in Colombia. But of course, being weak or non-existent in some particular regions, far away regions, the presence of the states, of course, it sometimes leads to this type of, of, of phenomena. So as a priority, uh, thinking about public policy, what we have to do is to keep on making huge efforts in order to guarantee the presence of the states in those regions. Now, as far as these two persons has to do, <coughs> Venezuela plays a role here. And Venezuela is playing a role since many years back, since the beginning of the government of uh, former, president, former President Chavez. They have protected, they have supported this type of organization. Recently, I was in the Permanent Council of the Organization of American States to show evidences of that link and that, and that support, and I had the chance to let the ambassadors listen a speech given by former President Chavez saying that he thought that FARC and, e and ELN were not terrorist organizations, but political fighters that has, that has an army, and uh, announced the political support to them. And recently, President, the, the dictator Maduro, uh, invited these two persons that later on announced the formation of a new narco trafficking organization to go to Venezuela. It was public and I let the ambassadors of the Organization of American States as well listen to this speech, recent speech, few days before the announcement of alias Marquez and Santrich to invite them to to Venezuela. So the link is the link is clear since many years back. Mm -hmm. If there are no more questions, um, it falls to me to thank the minister very much for thank you uh, very much. his comprehensive presentation of the situation in his country, um, the um, situation in regard to the uh, peace process. 
And I think it, it will have struck everybody that um, relations with Venezuela figured in many instances in this regard. Um, the uh, presentation um, was um, very instructive, but the uh, answer that you gave to the questions and the comments that were made, I think were a testimony to your openness and to your willingness to uh, deal with the issues that were raised. Uh, thank you very much for that. As far as the uh, peace process is concerned, as you've said already, it's, it's complicated, it's a long-term one, um, and you uh, said there is a lot of work to be done. We wish you every success in the work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>